Chapter 23 Cody hid in her trailer, waiting for everyone to leave for the day. She spent some time going over the revised pages of the script for the dining room scene. Persia's idea is really silly, Cody thought. Callie and I weren't like that. I can't imagine two teenage girls who are so competitive that they argue over who gets to pass a knife at her father. I can't believe that Bo likes the idea, Cody thought, staring out the trailer window as the sun lowered behind the trees. He says it's good character development. Well, fine. Of course I'll play this scene without making a fuss. I mean, no one asked my opinion anyway. Persia is the pro, after all. And what am I, Cody thought unhappily. I'm the freak. I'm the real-life freak people can point out to in the movie theater and say to each other, Did you know she's the real sister? Cody let out a bitter sigh. I want to see my real sister, she thought. Callie is in the house. I saw her, and tonight I'm going to find her. Or maybe she'll find me. Cody tried to phone Rob at the hospital, but the cellular phone in the trailer didn't seem to be working. She heard a busy signal as soon as she clicked it on. Settling onto the couch to wait for the house to empty out, she soon drifted into an uneasy sleep. She dreamed of her parents. She was home with them in Los Angeles. They were all eating donuts. Big, sugary donuts. But the sickening, putrid taste of the green goo invaded Cody's dream. The donuts smelled so rotten, like decayed, maggoty meat, and they tasted even worse. Cody woke up gagging. She sat up, swallowing hard, shaking her head to chase away the ugly dream. The sky was dark, she saw. She must have slept for an hour or two. She peered out the trailer window at the house, also dark. Callie, I'm going to find you tonight, she murmured out loud. She bent over the mirror and pushed back her blonde hair with both hands. Then she quickly rubbed on some clear lip gloss. Her heart pounding, she stepped down from the trailer, closing the door softly behind her. A warm breeze made the tall grass rustle as Cody made her way over the lawn to the house. Cricket started a shrill symphony as she reached the front porch. I feel so nervous, Cody realized. The nap hadn't helped to calm her. It had made her somehow even more edgy. The front door creaked loudly as she pushed it open. The old haunted house special effect, she thought. She stepped into the front entryway. A rectangle of light from the living room slid over the carpet. Someone must have left a lamp on. Cody stepped into the light and gazed into the living room. Dark metal equipment boxes were stacked in front of the fireplace. Several microphones rested near Coyle's electrical cable against the far wall. Cody turned back into the hallway. She took a step toward the kitchen. Then she heard the voice, soft as a whisper. Cody, here I am. Oh! Cody uttered a shocked cry and spun around. Are you looking for me? Callie's voice, soft and playful. Yeah, Cody stammered. I want to see you, Callie. I miss you. Follow me, Cody. Callie's voice moved toward the back hall. I can't believe it's really you, Cody cried, feeling her emotions swell. She didn't know how much longer she could hold back the tears. Where are you, Callie? Can I see you? Can I hug you? Follow me, Callie repeated. I'm right here, Cody. In a dim hall light, Cody saw that the door to the basement stood open. Callie's voice seemed to come from the doorway. Cody realized her entire body was trembling with excitement. Do you want me to come downstairs, Callie? Can't we talk up here? Can't I see you now? Soon, Callie replied, her voice soft and cool. Come downstairs with me, Cody. Don't be afraid. Cody hesitated at the top of the basement stairs. What about the rats? What about the explosives? Don't be afraid, Callie instructed. Come down with me, Cody. I've waited so long to talk to you. Me too, Cody cried. Forgetting her fear, she plunged down the stairs. She stopped at the bottom and waited for her eyes to adjust to the darkness. Where are you, Callie? It's so dark down here. This way, Cody. I want to show you a special place. Cody fumbled against the wall, found the switch, clicked on the basement light. The crates of explosives, piled in the center of the floor, came into view. Cody saw a long wire stretching from the crates, leading to a box with a slender plunger, the detonator. That's weird, she thought. Has Bo wired the explosives for the end of the movie, even though we haven't begun shooting yet? Cody, please hurry. I'm so eager to talk to you. Callie's voice made Cody turn away from the wooden crates. Where are you? Cody called. Let me see you, please. I'm over here. Can't you hurry? Callie's voice floated to Cody from across the basement. Making her way past the explosives, Cody spotted a narrow doorway against the far wall. I never knew there was another room down here, she told her sister. She heard a scuttling sound behind her, the scratch of a rat's claws. The sound sent a chill down her back. Cody hurried through the narrow doorway and found herself in a dimly lit room no bigger than a closet. A bare light bulb hung from a frayed cord, casting a harsh yellow glow over the stone walls and concrete floor. A low three-legged stool stood against the back wall, the only furniture. Callie, are you in here? Cody whispered. Yes, here I am. 
A wisp of pale white light flickered above the stool. The light shimmered and grew until it resembled a small cloud. Cody let out a happy cry as Callie stepped out from the cloud. I knew I'd see you again, Cody exclaimed, her voice breaking with emotion. A smile spread across Callie's face. Her green eyes sparkled like bright emeralds. Her pale skin appeared to shimmer. Tears rolled down Cody's cheeks. She spread her arms, dove forward, and wrapped her sister in a hug. Oh! Cody pulled back, unable to hide her surprise. Callie, you're so cold! Callie's smile grew wider. Her eyes glowed brightly. Cody had to lower her gaze. I've waited so long for this, Cody, the ghost said, ignoring Cody's surprised cry. Cody felt the cold mist sweep over her. Callie seemed to fade behind the cloud. The mist billowed, folding Cody inside. Callie became a shadow in the mist. The shadow loomed over Cody. Billowing cold made Cody shudder. The shadow rolled down over her like darkness falling. Callie, no! Cody managed to fry out. Callie, what are you doing to me? Chapter 24 Over here, Cody, Bo said, gesturing with his clipboard to the chair at the dining room table beside Persia. Have you been to make up? Can't you tell? Cody teased. Everyone seemed to be in a better mood. Maybe they could actually get a scene on film. The night before, Bo had spent an hour on the phone with the studio execs. He told them things were going well, except for a few minor accidents. What a lie. So far, all he'd managed to get on film were some outside shots of the house. Now he had to knuckle down and get to work. He guided Cody to her place at the dining room table beside Persia. Then he discussed a lighting problem with one of the crew. He greeted Bert and Marge and asked Noah to get rid of his gum. One of the assistants hurried over to take the gum from the boy. Bo turned back to the actors. Cody sat rigidly beside Persia, who stared at her dark nails and didn't even bother to look up or say good morning. Nice day, Cody said, scooting her chair in. Persia muttered something under her breath in reply. How is everyone today? Bo called cheerily, resting his hands on Bert's shoulders. I love having a big roast beef dinner at seven in the morning, don't you? Bert and Marge laughed. Noah yawned and slid down in his chair so that his head barely poked over the table. Bo, I can't believe we're actually going to be shooting a scene, Persia remarked, rolling her eyes. She turned to Cody. Is my wig on straight? Yours is a little crooked. I'm not wearing a wig, Cody replied sharply. That's your real hair, Persia asked, pretending to be surprised. I told my hairdresser not to make the wig so neat. I mean, your hair is always so free. Since I'm stuck playing you, I wanted my hair to have that same disheveled look. Thanks, Cody replied sarcastically. Persia, give her a break, Bo interrupted. He stepped back toward the camera. One run through, then we shoot. He turned toward the back and shouted, Props, let's get the food out, okay? Coming right out, we're spraying the meat, a woman's voice called from the kitchen. That's to make it shine and look yummy, Bo explained to Cody. He turned to Persia. While we're waiting, let's block out your knife fight idea. I'm still not sure I get it. It's just a little competitive moment between the sisters, Persia told him impatiently. Cody always feels second best, right? She always feels left out. Callie is the beauty and the one with all the brains and all the luck and blah blah blah. We know all that, Bo said, glancing at his watch. So when Dad says, pass the carving knife, both sisters grab for it at the same time, Persia continued. And neither one wants to let go. They have a short tug of war, that's all. Just to show how competitive Cody feels. Let me see how it'll work, Bo said, rubbing the dark stubble on his chin. Run through it for me once. Bert passed the black-handled carving knife over to Persia. Persia placed it in front of Cody. Now, be careful and don't cut yourself, she told Cody, as if talking to a three-year-old. You should move the knife more between us, Cody suggested. That would make it more logical for me to reach for it. Persia slid the knife closer to Cody. Perhaps you could give Cody a little direction, Persia suggested to Bo. I know that Cody hasn't had any improv training. I don't want her to get any more tense than she already is. The poor thing is quivering like jelly. I am not, Cody protested shrilly, her face bright red. Let's just play through the scene, okay? Bo told Persia. I'm not so sure it's going to work anyway. It'll work if she can handle it, Persia replied coolly. Bert, give them some kind of cue, Bo instructed. Then, when the two sisters struggle over the knife, should I try to stop it? Marge asked. Let's see how it plays, Bo replied, stepping back. Let's go. Action. Bert cleared his throat. This roast beef looks delicious, he said, smiling down at an empty platter. Would you please pass the carving knife? Persia reached for the knife, but Cody grabbed it first. She lifted it by the handle, raised it straight up, then brought the blade down hard, plunging it through the back of Persia's hand, pinning Persia's hand to the table. 
Chapter 25 Bo stared frozen in shock as Cody let go of the knife and calmly lowered her hands to her lap. Persia didn't start screaming until the bright red blood began to pour over the back of her hand. It took a second for everyone to realize what had happened. Someone had replaced the prop knife with a real one. Frantically, she tried to tug her hand up from the table, which made the blade cut deeper. Blood flowed over her hand, puddled beneath it. You idiot! You idiot! she shrieked at Cody. It's not my fault, Cody cried, jumping to her feet. Someone switched the knives. It was supposed to be a prop knife. They all watched Cody step back, her hands pressed against her cheeks, as everyone crowded the table to help Persia. The room filled with startled cries and shouts of alarm. Call a doctor! Just call a doctor! Bo shouted. He tossed his flipboard furiously against the wall. What is going on here? He asked, trying to force down his anger and frustration. Two crew members struggled to pull the knife from the table to free Persia's hand. Persia screamed and cried, her eyes shut. Her face twisted in agony. I'm going to bleed to death. Somebody do something! Did someone call a doctor? Bo cried. Everyone was screaming, shouting out instructions, shouting their disbelief. The racket was deafening, and over the roar came Persia's shrill, angry wails. A few seconds later, they heard Persia's high-pitched squeal when the knife was finally pulled out of her hand. They stared at the widening bloodstain on the white tablecloth. Two men were wrapping a white linen napkin around Persia's hand. The blood soaked quickly through the napkin. Is a doctor on the way? Did you call 911? Is that an ambulance outside? Confused and frightened shouts filled the house. As two paramedics burst into the room, Bo saw Cody backing away. He moved quickly to confront her. I need to speak to you. She hesitated, squinting against the bright white lights. I need to speak to you now, Bo insisted, hands pressed tensely against his waist. Well, what is it? Cody stammered. I've tried to be understanding, Bo said, sighing at Cody. But this time it's gone too far. I can't let this go on. Too many people have gotten hurt. I feel so terrible, Cody said. Bo frowned at her. Too many incidents. Too many accidents, he murmured. She swallowed hard. I don't understand. I'm not superstitious, Bo told her. He had to raise his voice to be heard over Persia's cries from the table. But it's pretty obvious to me that this picture is jinxed. Cody's mouth dropped open. I still don't understand. I don't either, Bo replied. But it must have something to do with you, Cody. Something to do with the fact that you lived in this house, that you experienced its evil. But, Bo, Cody started to say, shielding her eyes from the bright spotlight. He raised a hand to silence her. So much has gone wrong since we arrived here, he said, sighing. And each time, you have been there, Cody. Each time, you were standing there while something horrible happened. I'm not saying you're the cause of our problems. I'm not saying you're responsible. But you're the jinx. I know you are. Bo, that's crazy, Cody replied. You don't really believe that I... Bo nodded solemnly. I have to ask you to leave, he said softly. I have to remove you from the picture. He expected her to lower her eyes and retreat quickly. He expected tears. He expected her to plead and beg for another chance. Instead, Cody startled him by reacting differently. No, you don't, she replied sharply. No way, Bo. No way I'm leaving. I'm really sorry, Bo said. No, I'm the one who is sorry, Cody declared. She lifted the big glowing spotlight by its paw, swung it hard, and slammed the front of the light into Bo's face. Stunned, as the pain burst over him, he tossed up his arms and staggered back. But she kept the light pressed against his face until his skin sizzled. When she finally tossed the light to the floor, the side of Bo's face smoked. He let out a weak gurgling sound and slumped to the floor. Before he lost consciousness, he heard Cody's cheerful shout to the others, Okay, everyone, that's a wrap! Chapter 26 Cody hunched down on the low stool, struggling against the ropes that held her arms and legs. The handkerchief tied around her face as a gag choked her dry throat. She had twisted and pulled at the ropes for hours, with no success. How long has she been locked down in the basement? Terrified and exhausted, she had lost track of the time. She knew it must be daytime. She heard the voices above her head, heard the screams, heard all the commotion. She knew Callie had taken her place. She knew Callie was upstairs in the dining room, pretending to be her. And now Cody knew that Callie had become evil. Callie was not Callie anymore. The night before, the shadow of Callie had swept over Cody, darkened over her. Darkened until Cody felt as if she were floating in a cold, bottomless cavern. In the icy darkness, Cody felt Callie's evil. She felt Callie's anger, felt the hatred that filled her heart. When the darkness lifted, Cody found herself locked in the bare basement room, gagged, her ankles tied together her hands tied behind her back. Callie, she realized, had lured her there and then imprisoned her, determined to take her place. And now, what was Callie doing upstairs? As Cody sat hunched over the low stool, struggling to hear, 
Other sounds invaded her ears. The scratching, scuttling sounds. The swish of tails being dragged over the basement floor. The rats, so close. So close, Cody thought she could hear them breathe. She heard a shrill hiss. The scratching grew nearer. Cody struggled awkwardly to her feet and glanced around the walls of the small room. Where were the rats? Why did they sound so close? Her heart began to thud in her chest. She swallowed hard. Another hiss, almost like dry laughter. The scratch of sharp rat claws. Where? Where are they? Cody spun to the door, then turned back, and spotted the hole in the wall, a slender crack down near the floor. Just a crack, but big enough for a rat to crawl through, or several rats. Staring hard at the crack between two stones, she dropped to her knees. She lowered her head to the crack and listened, scratching, a shrill, screeching hiss. Yes, the rats were on the other side, Cody realized, but could they squeeze through the crack? Were they going to? Chapter 27 Cody shuddered as she lowered her face to the crack and peered through it. To her surprise, she saw light on the other side. Tilting her head down to see, the gag popped off Cody's face. She swallowed hard. As her eyes focused, she saw a rat sitting on its haunches. Another rat, its scraggly whiskers twitching, bared its teeth and hissed at the first rat. Cody's breath caught in her throat as she struggled to see the other room clearly. How many rats were in that room? There, there, dear. The sound of the woman's voice made Cody jerk back. Startled, she raised herself on her knees and struggled to catch her breath. There, there, that's it, dear. The voice sounded so familiar, but who would be down in the basement, and whom was the woman talking to? Struggling to balance, Cody took a deep breath and lowered her face once again to the slender crack in the wall. The rats had moved, she saw, or perhaps these were different rats. One of them, a plump brown creature with a long hairy tail, scuttled in quick circles. Stop that, dear. You'll only tire yourself, the woman's voice scolded. Cody raised her eyes and discovered the owner of the voice, Mrs. Nordstrom. The housekeeper sat on a low stool similar to the one in Cody's small room, bending and talking to the rats at her feet. No, Cody thought, this is a dream. This can't be real. Shifting her body to get a better view, Cody squinted hard into the next room and saw two other familiar figures seated beside Mrs. Nordstrom. Look at him run in circles, Mr. Hankers exclaimed elbowing Mr. Lurie in the ribs. Don't tire yourself, Mrs. Nordstrom scolded the circling rat. Mr. Hankers tore off a strip of cheese from a slice he held between both hands and tossed it to the rat. The other rats, at least six or seven of them, began to screech excitedly and jump up and down on Mr. Hankers' pants legs. Mr. Hankers was supposed to kill the rats, could he told herself, staring in shock. Instead, he's feeding them. Feeling her throat tighten in disgust, could he watch Mr. Lurie, the real estate agent, reached down and picked up a fat gray rat in his fist. The rat squawked and thrashed. Laughing, Mr. Lurie set the creature down on the shoulder of his gray suit jacket. The rat immediately jumped to the floor. Ha ha, Mrs. Nordstrom crackled. He doesn't like you. Oh, they don't like you either, Mr. Lurie griped sourly. Mrs. Nordstrom flashed him a wink. Oh yeah? Watch this. As Cody watched with growing revulsion, Mrs. Nordstrom lowered both hands to the floor. Come on, fellas, she cooed. A rat scuttled onto each hand. A pleased grin spread over Mrs. Nordstrom's face. She raised them up, holding the rats in her palms. Then she started to giggle as the rats stretched out their claws and nibbled and gnawed on her fingers. Ah, oh, how gross! Cody didn't realize she had cried out. She saw Mrs. Nordstrom glance up from the gnawing rats. Cody gasped. Did she hear me? What is she going to do? Chapter 28 Come on, dear. Leave me a little skin on that finger, Mrs. Nordstrom scolded one of the rats. He likes to suck the blood, Mr. Hanker said, snickering. Cody sighed with relief. They hadn't heard her. She dropped back onto the stool, her head spinning with questions. Why were these three people sitting in the hidden basement room? Did they live there? Why were they playing with the rats, talking to them, letting the ugly creatures chew their fingers? Why, why, why? The question spun around and around in Cody's mind as if caught in a whirling cyclone. I've got to get out of here, she told herself. I've got to get away. She struggled again to loosen the ropes, but a word spoken by Mrs. Nordstrom on the other side of the wall made Cody stop. The word was Callie. What is she saying about my sister? Cody wondered. She lowered her face at a crack in the wall and struggled to hear. Callie is a good girl, Mrs. Nordstrom was saying, tenderly stroking the scraggly gray fur on the back of the rat in her hand. She was a good girl, Mr. Lurie commented, but then we got hold of her. All three of them laughed. I said she's good because she does everything we tell her, Mrs. Nordstrom said. She sighed and set the rat down on the floor. It scrabbled over to join the others. You like them obedient, don't you, Mr. Hanker said, chuckling. 
obedient and ignorant, Mrs. Norsham replied, tossing the rats a slice of cheese and watching them battle over it. That girl thinks she's obeying her own will. All three of them laughed as if Mrs. Nordstrom had cracked a very funny joke. Cody pulled back from the wall. She shut her eyes, trying to figure out what she had just heard. They just explained why Callie is so evil, she realized. I was right when I thought that Callie isn't Callie. Those three weird people are controlling her. They've tricked Callie into obeying their wishes. Or maybe they possessed her somehow. Cody realized she didn't understand any of it. She only knew that she was now afraid for Callie, as well as for herself. Shutting her eyes, she tried to think clearly, but nothing made any sense. She lost track of time again. The house had become silent. The excited, shouting voices from upstairs had all vanished. No footsteps, no sounds at all. What am I going to do? Cody asked herself. What can I do? When she opened her eyes, Callie was standing in front of her. Cody gasped and jumped to her feet. Callie! Callie's green eyes stared coldly at her. Her expression revealed no emotion at all. Callie, what happened upstairs? What's going on? Her sister's ghost didn't reply. Instead, she moved menacingly toward Cody. No, Cody shrieked, feeling terror in her chest. Callie, no. What are you going to do? Goodbye, sister, Callie replied coldly. Goodbye, forever. Chapter 29 No, Callie, please, Cody begged as the ghost floated nearer. Don't hurt me. Callie's pale lips twisted in an amused smile hurt you. I don't need to. She pulled the ropes off Cody's arms and legs. Then she waved to the open doorway. Go. Cody's entire body trembled as she stared at her sister's cruel smile. Go, Callie repeated. The door is open, Cody. And then she shouted impatiently. Go. But Cody started to the door, then hesitated. You're not going to kill me? She choked out. No need, Callie replied casually. I've already taken care of you, Cody. W what do you mean? Cody stammered, edging toward the door. You did some bad things upstairs this morning, Callie replied, her green eyes glowing. You stabbed Persia Bryce, and then you held a spotlight to the director's face. You burned him so badly, his own mother wouldn't recognize him. No, Cody cried in horror. Callie, you didn't. Callie nodded, her smile growing wider. I did. I'm sorry, Cody. I don't think you're going to be a movie star after all. I think you're going to spend a lot of years in prison or in a mental hospital. Cody struggled to speak. Had Callie really ruined her life? Why? Why did Callie hate her so much? It's the evil in the house, Cody told herself. It's the three evil people in the next room. They're controlling Callie. They're making Callie do these things. Cody took a deep breath. I came here to keep a promise, she remembered. I came back here to help Callie, and I have to try to do that. Go, Callie shouted angrily, pointing to the door. Hurry, get out of here. And then she added bitterly, have a nice life. Cody took a step toward her sister. I won't go until you listen to me, she insisted. Callie's mouth twisted into a sneer. You have nothing to say to me. Yes, I do, Cody replied, gathering her courage. Do you remember the story your boyfriend Anthony told us about this house? Do you remember? He said that when the workers dug the foundation, they found bodies buried in the ground. The people buried here were the victims of Angelica and Simon Fear. Remember? So what? Callie snapped. The house was built on top of their graves, Cody continued, her voice trembling. It's an evil place, Callie, filled with evil, and somehow, the three people in the next room, Mrs. Nordstrom and the two men, they're controlling you. They're evil, too, and they... Who? Callie screamed, her eyes flashing angrily. The dust sparked up around her as she swirled closer. What are you talking about? In the next room, Cody told her, pointing to the wall. They play with the rats. They're supposed to be working for us, but instead, they... 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 Cody stopped. She could see from Callie's bewildered expression that she had no idea what power these three people had over her. Have a nice time at the mental hospital, Callie said softly. She let out a bitter laugh. Send me a postcard. No, Cody cried, grabbing her sister's hand. It felt so cold, Cody nearly dropped it. But she managed to hold on and tugged her sister to the small hole in the wall. I'm not crazy, Cody insisted. Take a look through there, Callie. I'm not crazy. I want you to see the truth. I know this isn't you. I know you're not cruel and evil. It's them, Callie. It's them. Take a look, please. Callie made no move toward the narrow hall. I really don't care, she said flatly, her voice as dry as air. I'm dead. I don't care about holes in the wall. Please, Cody begged. Take a look at them. Take a look at their evil faces. They're controlling you. They're using you. I heard them talk about it. I heard them laugh about it. They're making you do these horrible things. Callie hesitated, then floated down and peered through the crack in the wall. Cody stood tensely in the center of the small room, watching her sister. Callie seemed to freeze there. She didn't move or blink. 
She stared into the other room for several minutes, her face completely expressionless. When she rose up and turned back to Cody, her expression had softened. The angry glow had faded from her eyes. Did you see them? Cody asked eagerly. Did you see them with the rats? Callie didn't reply. She floated away from the wall, her pale face shimmering in and out of focus, her expression thoughtful. Did you see them? Cody insisted. Do you believe me now? Callie stared at Cody, as if gazing right through her. Come with me, Cody, she whispered finally. I will get you out of this house. Cody let out a sigh of relief. Callie believes me, she told herself. I knew it could reach her. I knew it could show her the truth. But how can I help her? How? The explosives, Cody cried. We can blow up the house, blow up all the evil. Callie raised a finger to her lips to silence Cody. Never mind that, she said softly. Let me get you out of here. Come with me. Hurry. Callie swept past Cody and led the way to the door. Her heart pounding, Cody followed close behind. Out into the basement, gray evening light floated in from the narrow window, casting long shadows across the floor. Thank you, Callie, a voice said. Cody let out a low cry as Mrs. Nordstrom stepped forward, followed by Mr. Hankers and Mr. Lorry. Thank you for bringing her to us, Callie, Mrs. Nordstrom said, smiling warmly. Now we will make sure you get your revenge. Chapter 30 You tricked me, Cody screeched at her sister. You betrayed me. Mrs. Nordstrom and the two men moved nearer, circling Cody, their faces set, their eyes narrowed, cold and menacingly. Callie, I'm your sister, your twin. How could you? Cody shrieked. So frightened she didn't recognize her own voice. Callie's face remained blank and uncaring. I wouldn't betray you, she replied softly. You showed me the truth. Run to the stairs, Cody. Run now. I will protect you from them. Cody gasped as Mrs. Nordstrom and the two men moved closer. Was this just a trick, or was Callie really going to protect her, to save her? Run, Callie screamed. Cody began backing toward the stairs, her eyes on the three people. Hurry. Run, Callie urged. But Cody stopped and stared in horror as Mrs. Nordstrom and the two men began to change. Their skin bubbled and blistered, darkening to a splotchy gray. Short, stubbly hair sprouted all over their faces and hands. Slowly, their faces stretched. Their noses lengthened into dark, hairy snouts. Sticky, white whiskers twitched over jagged yellow teeth. Snake-like red tongues flicked over their gnarled teeth. Their wet eyes shriveled behind the twitching snouts to black marbles. Cody gasped in shock as the three figures shrank and their clothing fell away. Out from under the clothing darted three plump gray rats. Scuttling out from her skirt, Mrs. Nordstrom hissed at Cody and raised her rat claws menacingly. Mr. Lurie snapped his long pink tail behind him. A line of drool fell from Mr. Hankers' snarling mouth as he scratched the gray fur of his belly with both claws. No, Cody cried in a trembling, weak voice. No, you, you can't be. She backed to the stairs, her eyes wide in terror and disbelief. Rats. They're all rats, all three of them. Mrs. Nordstrom bared her teeth and, with a shrill hiss, leaped at Cody's ankle. Cody cried out and kicked the plump rat hard. Her sneaker made a soft plop as it collided with the hissing rat, sending it sprawling onto his back beside his two snarling companions. Run, Cody, run, Callie was screaming. And as she backed toward the stairs, Cody saw more rats slithering out into the basement. From behind the furnace, from behind the crates of explosives, from holes in the walls and cracks in the floor, the rats, dozens and dozens of them, crept out. Screeching and hissing, sweeping their hairless pink tails behind them, rats blanketed the floor, a sea of gnarled teeth and glowing eyes. Struggling to move her trembling legs, Cody grabbed the railing and pulled herself onto the first step. Hurry, Callie urged, moving toward the explosives detonator. Cody, hurry! The floor appeared to seethe and toss, so many great bodies rushing forward, screeching and hissing and snapping at their jaws. But wha what about you? Cody stammered. I'm dead, came Callie's heartbreaking reply. The screeching of the rats drowned out Cody's sob. The rats suddenly swept forward, hissing and whistling. Their claws thrashed the air as they scuttled to the stairs. Ow! Cody shrieked as a rat scratched his claw against her leg. A thousand eyes glared hungrily, moving toward her. Taking one last look at her sister, she turned and forced her legs to carry her up the stairs. Into the hallway, the screeching, the hissing, the sound of scrabbling feet following her, driving her forward, making her run. Past the dark living room, out the front door, into the darkness of the front yard. Running across the grass, gasping for air, the horrifying sounds of the rats lingering in her ears. Cody was halfway to the street when the force of the explosion threw her to the ground. Oh! Landing hard at her knees and elbows, she let out a groan. The ground shook. She turned back to the house in time to see the blinding white burst, as bright as the sun. I can't see, Cody thought, and then the white darkened to scarlet. A loud roar louder than thunder made her cover her ears. The roof shot up, shattering as it flew. 
rising above the dark trees, and then a wall of flame rose over the house, a roaring tidal wave of fire. No! Cody couldn't hear her own terrified wail over the crackling thunder of the blaze. Squinting into the fiery red brightness, she began to see dark shapes, rat bodies thrashing wildly, flying helplessly in the raging flames, hundreds of rats shooting skyward in the fire, sizzling, burning as they flew. Cody felt her stomach heave, felt the disgust rise up in her, but she couldn't take her eyes away from the fiery sky, from the charred black rat bodies that flew over the roaring flames. And then human forms twisted up in the fire, black shadows, the dark, tortured spirits of those buried under the house, men and women, wailing and howling, thrashing into flames as they rose higher, higher, and disappeared into the starless black sky. Cody cried out as a wall crashed to the ground. Red embers shot out in all directions. Gripped with horror, she stared, stared as the mournful howls faded into the roar of the flames, stared as the tortured bodies twisted up into the smoke-blackened sky, stared as the wall of flames swallowed the house, consuming the evil, burning it all away. On her knees on the cool, soft grass, Cody stared into the flames, letting the heat of the fire dry her tears. I'm sorry, Callie, she remembered softly. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to say goodbye. Chapter 31 What's up with you? Don't you ever want to go out? Rob asked. Cody crossed the room and sat down across from him on the small, matching white leather armchair. The police called again this morning. It's been a week since the explosion, and they still can't figure out what happened. Everyone had a different story, and no one version is stranger than the next. And they still have trouble believing that it was Callie, not me, who did all those horrible things. Cody sighed. Fortunately, they're going to drop it. Of course, I'm still going to have to go to therapy twice a week, but I'm glad no one is pressing charges. Yeah, agreed Rob. I just want to forget the whole thing. Me too. Anyway, I just feel like staying in. My parents are out for the night. I ordered a pizza. Rob made a face. Pizza again? I like pizza, Cody insisted. What can I say? I have simple tastes. You must have simple tastes. You're going out with me, Rob joked. It was three weeks after the fire that had destroyed 99 Fear Street and put an end to the movie production. Back in her parents' apartment in Los Angeles, Cody remained dazed by all that had happened. But Rob had been coming over nearly every day. He had managed to get her to smile and laugh again and feel almost normal. I auditioned for a commercial this afternoon, he told her. That's great, Cody replied enthusiastically. It's for another dog food, but this time I don't have to bark, Rob told her. They both laughed. The doorbell rang. That's the pizza, Cody told him, climbing to her feet. Get the door. I'll go get some Cokes. Cody hurried to the kitchen and pulled two cans of Coke from the refrigerator. When she returned to the living room, she was surprised to see Rob holding a large brown envelope. Not the pizza, he said. He removed a video cassette from the envelope. A note was taped to the box. Cody pulled it off and read it. Here's a collector's item for you, Cody. It's the only film that was shot at 99 Fear Street. Talk about a big finish. Better luck to us all. Sam McCarthy. Who's McCarthy? Rob asked, leaning over her shoulder to read a note. You remember, Cody said softly. He was the associate producer. You know, his hand, it was mangled in the garbage disposal. Rob nodded, then slowly pulled the tape from the box. Do you want to see it? Maybe we shouldn't. It might upset you. Cody stared at the tape thoughtfully. Put it on, she instructed him. If it starts to get upsetting, we'll turn it off. Rob crossed the room to the video player. He clicked on the TV, then pushed the cassette into the VCR. Then he sat down beside Cody on the couch to watch. The screen was gray for a while. There was no sound. Then the screen suddenly blazed with color, bright flashes of red and yellow. It's the fire, Cody exclaimed, leaning closer to the screen. I don't believe it, Rob. Someone filmed the fire. They must have been shooting exterior shots for the end. Look, there goes a wall, Rob cried. The red glare of the TV screen reflected off their faces as they leaned forward to see better. The camera slid closer. The screen seemed to glow with bright white light. Oh! Cody let out a low cry as the faded image of a girl appeared inside the light, her features too faint to recognize. Who was that? Rob cried. Was someone caught in the fire? Cody rested her hand on his but didn't reply. Her entire body tensed as she leaned toward the screen. The girl in the fire raised one hand and waved it, a long, slow, sad wave. I don't get it. What is that? Rob asked impatiently. Cody squeezed his hand. She let the tears roll down her cheeks. That's my sister saying goodbye. 
This concludes the 99 Fear Street Trilogy. Hi, I'm Chris Evinger, and thank you for listening to Nightfall Audiobooks production of 99 Fear Street, The House of Evil, The Third Horror by R.L. Stein. I've had a lot of fun doing this trilogy. I have the rest of the year planned out. I want to do a spring, summer, fall, or Halloween style book, and then a Christmas book. Maybe four or five more books before the end of the year. I would like to do books that are themed with the season. So like a spring book in the springtime and a summer book in the summertime. I don't want to give you a Halloween book in the middle of April. That's just a little weird. I have the next book planned out. It's ready to go. It's The Cheater by R.L. Stein. The rest of this year will be R.L. Stein. The Cheater is a really good spring book. It's about satisfying your parents' very high expectations on test scores and things. And Carter Phillips decides to cheat on her SAT test. And boy, does it backfire. I like this book because I was able to put myself in Carter's position very easily. It's short. It should only be six or seven weeks. And that'll take us right into summer. I don't have the summer, fall, or Halloween books planned yet. But the Christmas book will be Silent Night. That's a super chiller. It's very big, and it should go from around Thanksgiving to through Christmas and maybe into the new year. I don't have the next year planned yet, but I am thinking that far ahead. I have seasons worked out, and that's an internal thing that I will be maintaining. Season 1 will be Trilogies by R.L. Stein. Season 2 is Fear Street. Season 3 are Super Chillers, and Season 4 is Point Horror. When I begin recording other authors like Christopher Pike, and I would love to do some Christopher Pike, I will update the season schedule appropriately. I just want you to be aware that if you see a season one, then a season three, then a season four, you're not wondering what's going on. It's because it's an internal thing. It's just how I keep track of what I'm recording and where. A little bit about me. I don't know if I've mentioned or not, but this is not my full-time gig. This is something I do on the side part-time for fun. And I really enjoy doing this. I like the recording. I like the editing. I like putting it all together. I like putting it up on YouTube. All of this is a lot of fun. I am a father. I have two children. Spare time on doing this is very, very hard to come by. Where I currently record is not ideal. The HVAC system kicks on at 6 o'clock in the morning. So I need to get up extremely early, run to my studio, record, and then begin my day job. I'm working on converting a part of my house to a permanent studio. I have an audio engineer and I'll be doing that in my spare time, but I wouldn't expect any updates anytime soon. Like I said, I have two kids and putting time aside to do anything in the house, like install the garbage disposal I bought two years ago. Seriously, I bought this thing two years ago and I haven't installed it yet. That's way more pressing than me being in the basement working on a studio on the side. I will be giving little updates at the beginning and end of each book so you know what's coming next down the pike if you want to get a hold of me i'm on twitter at nightfall audio or shoot me an email at nightfall audiobooks at gmail.com thank you for listening and i would love your feedback have a good day and stay safe